Amen, amen, amen. At this time, we'll go ahead and dismiss, both on my left and my right, to the young people. Shh, please dismiss quietly. The rest of us, if you would, grab your Bibles, stand with me, and turn to the book of Daniel, chapter 6. Daniel, chapter 6, beginning in verse 11. Daniel chapter 6, beginning in verse 11. Scripture reads there in Daniel chapter 6, beginning in verse 11. It says, Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. And then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any God or man within thirty days save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? And the king answered and said, This thing is true according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not. Then answered they and said before the king that Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree which thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him and he labored to the going down the sun to deliver him. Then these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and the Persians is that no decree nor statutes which the king establisheth may be changed. Then the king commanded and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went into his palace, and he passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions? Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouth, and they have not hurt me, for as much as before him innocency was found in me, and as before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Then was the king exceeding glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the, lion, uh, the den, so Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no manner of hurt was found upon him, because he believed in his God. And the king commanded, and they brought those men which had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, their wives, and the lions had the mastery of them, and break all their bones into pieces, or ever they came at the bottom of the den." Then King Darius wrote unto the people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is, a living, is the living God, and steadfast forever in his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall eve, be even unto the end. And he delivered and rescued, and he worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth. Who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius, reign of Cyrus the Persian. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we bow before you again tonight. We want to thank you and praise you once again for what we've been able to experience tonight. The baptismal service with Miss Margaret, we're so thankful for her testimony here tonight for the time of worship in which we had to be able to sing songs unto your high and holy name. 
I'm thankful, Lord, that we can say that we believe. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe in the resurrection. We believe in the blessed Holy Trinity. We believe in the second coming of Jesus. We believe that you are seated upon the throne and you're coming again to receive us unto yourself soon and very soon. We also believe, Lord Jesus, that you are a faithful God who works in our midst just like you did in the life of Daniel. I ask you, Lord Jesus, to hide me behind the cross tonight. I ask you to use me as your messenger, as your mouthpiece, as your word goes forth. If there's someone lost, I pray you'd save them tonight. For those that are, even I pray again for revival. For we need an awakening. We need a quickening. We need a stirring of our hearts and our lives as your church. We need you to do a work that only you can, Lord, in bringing revival in our personal lives and collectively as your spiritual body that we would be about your work here in this old, dark, and dying world. And so I pray, Lord, that you might even start right here tonight the Victory Baptist Church. And may that little spark catch on fire and spread not only here but throughout the entire world. We ask you to move in a way only you can as we trust in you tonight, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. This morning we started looking in Daniel chapter 6, and we talked about snuggling up to the lions. And as we began to look at the first 10 verses of Daniel chapter 6, we seen some a few things. We seen there that, um, you know, when we face the lions in our life, uh, we need to stay faithful to our God, no matter what our circumstances may be. Uh, we experience the favor of God as we stay faithful to him. And we've seen this in the life of Daniel, and not just Daniel. We've referenced a few other uh, historical, biblical people that we find in the Scriptures who God's favor was upon them as a result of their faithfulness to Him, uh, regardless of what their condition may have been in. And we talked about Daniel specifically on how that he probably was around the age of 15 when he was taken from his home there in Jerusalem. Uh, by Nebuchadnezzar and the army of Babylon that came down there and how that he was ripped from his home because he was of royal lineage. He also was of the cream of the crop. I mean, he was some of the brightest, amongst the brightest of all the young men of Israel. And Nebuchadnezzar had a plan for those individuals. He took them back to the palace. He would try to change a lot of things about them. He would try to change their name. He would try to change their language. He would try to change their diet. He would physically alter them. He turned them into eunuchs. Uh, those men would no longer be able to have children. Uh, he wanted them to be focused solely upon the things of his kingdom. And so that's what he did. He, he tried to change a lot of things concerning these young men that he brought over in captivity. But Daniel, regardless of his circumstance, stayed faithful to God and because of that experienced the favor of God. It started out in the very beginning when Daniel was there, when they tried to change his diet. Many of us would probably think, what's the big deal? You know, if King Nebuchadnezzar wants you to eat a hot dog, you eat a hot dog. Uh, you do what you're supposed to do. If he wants you to eat pork chops, you eat pork chops. The problem with that for you and for me, not a problem. But for Daniel and those Jewish boys, it was absolutely a problem. For they understood the law of God. They understood the law of Moses. They understood whether it was that of sacrifice or if it was that of their dietary laws. They had a command of God that they were not going to compromise. And those men said, and those young men, 15 years old, said we will not eat of anything that would defile us according to the law of God. And they asked that they could have what they normally would eat. Now, remember, they would not see the king very quickly. In fact, it would be three years. And so Daniel didn't ask of anything that might put necessarily the life of those that were over him in danger. He just asked, you just give us a few days. You feed us what we're supposed to eat according to the law of God. And I promise you that God will show you that he will sustain us and we'll do better eating what we're supposed to than even eating of the finest foods from the king's table. And so they granted Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, those, that wish, so to speak. And we see what happened. God 
blessed them and they had a better countenance and they were fatter than the others. It, it seemed no doubt that God honored them because of their faithfulness to him. That's where it all started, but it didn't stop there. Uh, we know that they went up through the ranks there and the government of the Babylonian Empire. And by this time, Daniel is getting very old in age, probably 15 when it started, more than likely around 85 or so at this time in his life, been in captivity for 70 years, been under the rule of Nebuchadnezzar, who because I believe because of the testimony and the faith of those Hebrew boys that turn into men, they're in captivity end up pointing him to the one true and living God. He was raised up by the Lord, according to the prophet Jeremiah, and was told that Nebuchadnezzar would reign for 70 years. He also was brought low, and he was out there in the field, like a wild man, like a wild animal, eating the grass of the field as he lost his mind. But when God brought him back in his right mind, Nebuchadnezzar ended up trusting in the God of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar's reign would end, the Babylonian Empire would fall to the Medes and the Persians, yet Daniel would continue in the favor of God and amongst men, and we see that in Daniel chapter 6. When you face the lions in life, you got to stay faithful to God and you'll experience his favor. And I told you that's not always easy. I'm not telling you that if you live for Jesus, that it's always easy and there is no troubles. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but that's a reality. And I've seen over the years in ministry, people come to know Jesus or people start coming back to church or people have a hard time. And so they think, well, if I start living for Jesus, things are going to get easier for me. And then all of a sudden they find out that's not exactly how it works. When you come to know Christ and you live for Christ, you can be assured that he's in you He's always going to be with you. Greater is he who's in you than he that's in the world. In Christ, you've overcome the world. We are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. When Satan comes to us, when we draw nigh to God, he draws nigh to us. When we resist the devil, he must flee. But he is as a roaring lion. And he is persistent. And he does not take any time off. He is constantly attacking the people of God and the ways of God and sometimes we're delivered from it, or sometimes God gives us grace as we go through it. But it's not easy living for Jesus, folks. Jesus told his disciples, the world hated me, the world's going to hate you. You're going to face troubles. You're going to face trials. You're going to face tribulations. You're going to have difficulties in this life. But you're not going to be alone. And my grace is sufficient for you. And so in order for us to experience the favor of God, no matter what our circumstance may be, we got to be faithful to him. We need to make sure that our eyes are on him when we face the lions. But not only when we face the lions should we stay faithful to experience the favor of God, but we also, as we face the lions, we got to be ready for the fight. Daniel heard the decree, and as you read the first 10 verses, as we look this morning, it didn't seem like anybody consulted with Daniel. Daniel, because of the favor of God, rose up in the ranks of government, came right underneath King Darius, was over the entire realm of the kingdom, and yet the presidents under him and all the other leaders under them, they came up with a plan because they did not like that Daniel was in the spot that he was in. And they could find no fault in him by himself. He was loyal to the king and to the kingdom right there with the Medes and the Persians. He was that way in Babylon. Many of us would think, man, we just need to rebel against the government as a whole. Well, if you read the scriptures, you'll be reminded that God's the one that allowed them to be taken into captivity and God's the one that told them, you might as well camp out. You might as well build houses. You might as well plant vineyards. You might as well go ahead and marry. You might as well go ahead and have children. You might as well pray for the towns in which you live in, in captivity, because you're going to be here for a while. You're going to be here for 70 years. You know why Daniel could be content? 
You know why Daniel could face his circumstances? Because he had faith in his God. And he trusted in him, whether he was in Jerusalem or whether he was in Babylon, whether it was Nebuchadnezzar ruling or whether it would be King Darius, he was trusting in his God. And so he was content where he was and he did what was right in the eyes of God and therefore they could not say anything about Daniel. And so this is what they come up with. We must go ahead and figure out a way to come up with something where Daniel would have to choose. Am I going to obey the law of the Medes and the Persians or am I going to obey the law of God? And you know what they knew about Daniel? That he was going to pick the law of God every single time. You don't have to worry about him cowering down. You weren't going to have to worry about him staying home. You weren't going to have to worry about him quit praying or preaching or sharing. He was going to live for his Lord no matter what man had to say. And they knew that about Daniel. And this wasn't some guy in his prime either. He wasn't somebody that was in his midlife as a warrior for God out there on the front lines and they were afraid of him because of that. No, this guy was 80 plus years old and he was getting close to the end of his life, yet they knew that this guy was not going to stop now. He stood firm when he was 15 and he was going to stand firm when he was an old man. He didn't change for those 70 years, amen? And you got to be ready for the fight, folks. Ooh, we got to be a people that understand that we're in a spiritual battle today. I'm not talking about the flesh and the blood. I'm not talking about what we got going on in the world that we can see with the natural eye. Evil is real. You can see that. You can see all kinds of wickedness out there. But the Bible teaches us that you and I must go to battle, but we've got to be good soldiers of the Lord. And we've got to put on the armor of our faith. And we've got to have the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. And we have got to have ourselves prepared through prayer. And we have got to go out here into the kingdom of darkness with the gospel of light that we might rescue the perishing. We have under, we got to understand that we are in a battle. But listen, we also got to understand that the war's done being won. See, we get to look back. Daniel's still looking forward. Daniel's looking for Messiah. Daniel's seen a lot of things that God showed him, and he didn't get to see it all yet at this point. He's going to show him a little more later on in the next chapters if you go ahead and read, or if you've been here on Wednesday nights, you've already seen a lot of those. See, Daniel's already had some understanding. He's going to understand about uh, the time of the Gentiles and the worldwide rulers of the Gentile nations that God's going to raise up. He's shown him Babylon. He's shown them the Medes and the Pers Persians. He's shown them Greece. He's shown them Rome. He's showing them that this empire is yet to rise up, is going to rise up at the end. Daniel's seen a lot of things concerning the nation of Israel and his people. He's seen all that. He sees that God's in control, folks. And so when he sees all that and he hears this decree, he doesn't waste any time. He went ahead and opened up his windows and he knelt down and he prayed towards Jerusalem. Not one time. Not two times, but three times a day. He didn't hide in his closet. He didn't close the windows. He didn't uh, just fold his arms. Or he, You know what? You don't have to be in a certain type of posture to pray. You know that, right? You don't have to have your hands folded and your eyes closed, your head bowed to necessarily pray. You could look at me in my face and not say a word and be praying unto God. But Daniel wasn't trying to hide. Daniel was accustomed to doing what he did every single day. And these folks that brought up this scheme and plan about nobody should be allowed to pray or ask of any supplication into any God or any man except for the king, they knew exactly what Daniel was going to do. And when he heard that the decree was signed, he went about his business and he went about the fight and he started the fight on his knees because he knew the God in whom he served could fight the fight for him. And so he started. So we got to be willing and ready to fight. That's what he did. 
you, you, you have to be a person who is consistent. And that's what Daniel was. He was a man who was consistent. Well, as we get down into verse 11, he says, These men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. And they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any God or a man within 30 days save thee, O king, thou hast cast into the lion's den? And the king answered and said, This thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not. Then answered they and said before the king that Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. <laughs> when I think about this verse of scripture right here, I think about exactly how the enemy works. The enemy is going to approach our king, the Lord Jesus. That's how Satan is. He's an accuser of the brethren. He is constantly accusing you and me and those that have trusted Jesus about all of our sin, all of our failures, all of the fact, the things that make us unworthy. And let me tell you something. It's like what Brother Grant said today in our Sunday school class. You know what? Probably got a long list of things that he can go before the Lord on and he can talk about. But you know what, folks? As they approached the king, I like how they approached it. Uh, they said, uh, that, you know, Daniel the one that's of the children of the captivity of Judah, uh, they tried to talk about his captivity. Uh, they didn't talk about that he was second in command. They didn't bring that fact up. See, when you face the lions, you got to be content with who, or confident rather, with who you are in the Lord. See, when you face the lions, folks, that's going to be a big question. Uh, Satan's going to whisper in your ear, Satan's going to tell you how unworthy you are. Satan's going to tell you how that God don't care a thing about you and God forgot about you and, and you're nothing in his eyes, just like they tried to say to the king. Daniel, you know him, the one that's of the children of captivity of Judah? They didn't tell him that he was once the president that was above the other two presidents. They didn't remind him of the fact that Daniel moved up to be right under him and he was over the whole realm. They didn't remind him and it wasn't like the king didn't know who Daniel was. It'd be hard for me to believe that King Darius forgot who it was that was running his kingdom. That's kind of weird, right? I mean, we may not always want to identify with some of our folks. It's kind of funny to me sometimes when you watch the presidents of the United States and they have a little bit of, of, of rift between them and the vice president. It's kind of funny to me when you watch it. You know, I don't care who it is. It's just kind of funny to me because they were real big buddies when they were running. And then they get in their spot and they're doing all fine. But then the vice president, you know, I know they want to be the president, you know. But they're doing their little thing. And if it's a little, see, sometimes a little rift. Sometimes there's currently a little rift amongst our president and, and the vice president. You know, you see not even the former president. There becomes a rift sometimes. But do you think that our president doesn't know who the vice president is? Of course he knows. Well, I don't know what he knows sometimes. <laughs> I'm going to take that back. Normal situations, of course he's going to know. Okay. So my point is in this passage of Scripture, they come as if they're downplaying who this man is. And let me tell you something. Daniel wasn't just any man. And let me tell you something about you. If you know Jesus as your own personal Lord and Savior, you're not just anybody. I want you to understand that. I understand where I come from. I come from nothing. Really did. I understand who I am in and of myself. I'm nothing. I understand that. And there ain't nobody no different than that. I come to learn that a long time ago. Used to have a little bit of a complex, to be honest about it, because I was nothing, still am nothing, and accomplished nothing of myself. I understand all that. But the more I have found confidence in the Lord Jesus, the more I don't, I don't worry about nothing else. It don't matter to me who's out there. It doesn't matter to me what title somebody has. I can respect the person and the position as what God says, but you know what, folks? I know who I am too. 
I know who my father is. I know who my elder brother is. I know that I'm a part of his kingdom. I know that I'm part of the kingdom of priests that he has established. I know whom I believed. I know that my sin has been forgiven. I know I have direct access to my God in glory. I know that I'm a joint heir with Jesus, folks. I know all these things. And so when we face uh, the lines of this life, you can't forget who you are in Jesus Christ, folks. No. Let me give you an example. In the book of Acts, there was a story about the seven sons of Sceva. And these seven sons of Sceva were witnessing some things that Paul had done. Paul had cast out some demons of some, that was in some folks, and, and they had seen this and witnessed this, and there was somebody there in the town that had a possession of demons themselves. And the seven sons of Sceva, because these how people are, they like to look on the outside and see what God's doing, and they want a part of it without really trusting in him. And so they, they came in and they tried to cast out the demons that were there in this individual. And you know what those demons said to that person, those seven sons of Sceva? Them demons said, Jesus we know and Paul we know. But you, we don't know who you are. And next thing you know, them demons through that individual wore them seven sons of Sceva out. And I mean, physically just wore them out and they had to get out of that place. Now, let me tell you something. Mark this down. If you know Jesus, the enemy knows you. You mark it down. Especially if you've been trying to live for him any means. You say, you sure about that, Brother Anthony? I'm not trying to tell you that you're the Apostle Paul or Peter or John. I sure ain't trying to tell you that you're Jesus. But I am trying to tell you this. When you come to know Christ, you brought into the family of God. He's forgiven you. He's saved you. He's made you alive and born again. He's given you a purpose and a plan. He's empowered you to go out. When you start engaging this world with the gospel of Christ, I guarantee you the enemy knows and takes note. That's why he begins to fight like he fights, folks. Before I got saved, you think the enemy bothered me much? No. The, the enemy would do nothing but to keep me deceived. The enemy would do nothing but try to keep me content in my lost state on the broad path headed to a devil's hell. But when I got saved September 20th of 1998, I asked Jesus into my life. From that point on, Satan knew that I no longer was his. And I started living for him and telling other people about Jesus. He took note. He took note. And you know what you need to do? I don't care if Satan knows who you are or not, really. Don't care if he knows who I am. But you've got to know who you are. You've got to know who you are in Christ Jesus. And I'm not talking about going around here with some attitude of arrogance. Paul said that we have nothing to boast in save Christ. And you and I can boast in him. You and I can walk around with confidence in him. Because our righteousness is found in him. Our security is found in him. Our hope is found in him. And he is in us. And he's working through our lives. And so when I read this little verse of scripture, where they come to the king and they said, You know Daniel, which of the children of the captivity of Judah, he regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. Then when the king heard these words, look what he says. He was sore displeased with himself. He wasn't even mad at Daniel. He was displeased with himself. You know why? Because the king allowed his ego to get in the way and he was haste to sign off on a decree that didn't make any sense. I told you this morning, didn't make any sense. What king in the right mind wants a whole kingdom of people to come to him with every supplication for 30 days? That don't make any sense. But let me tell you something. That's how the enemy is. The enemy cares not how he's going to bring an attack. His only desire is to bring an, atta an attack to destroy you, to kill you 
to harm you. That's what he used to do. You say, isn't that a little extreme, Brother Anthony? No. Satan comes, will do what? But to kill and destroy. He's a murderer. He's a liar and the father thereof. That's what he wants to do. In Christ is life. In him is death. And that's what he wants to do, folks. He wants to harm you in any fashion that he can, in any fashion that God may allow him. As we talked and made reference a little bit this morning to the book of Job, when Job went about searching throughout the world, seeking whom he may devour, that's what he meant. This isn't some uh, you know, fictional story. Satan's real. And he's going throughout the world seeking whom he can devour and to destroy. And, and God says, well, have you tried Job, my servant? He said, well, you know I can't get to Job. You've got a hedge of protection around him. I'm sure every once in a while he went by Job, wondering if that hedge had been taken down or not. And God said, well, how about you can do whatever you want to, but you can't touch Job. And so what did Satan do? Satan took all of his finances away, right? I mean, he just stripped him of his resources. Boy, do worse than that. Killed all of his kids. Killed all of his kids in one swoop as they were all together, having them a cookout amongst themselves, siblings coming together and enjoying each other's presence. And, and, and Satan stirs up a storm, comes through, wipes out the house, and kills all Job's children. Job was a man that nobody was like him on the face of the earth. God himself said that. The righteous man feared God. He eschewed evil. He did what was right in the eyes of God, and Satan had him in his crosshairs, folks. And when God allowed Satan to do something, even though he couldn't touch Job, he did all that he could, and he killed his children. Let me tell you something. How many would say that Job would have rather him Get him, not his kids. I would have. I mean, if I had to pick, I would have said, you come at me. But what did Job say after he put on sackcloth and ash and sought the Lord? He said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. See, folks, when you think about how the enemy works, You've got to know who you are in Christ, and you've also got to know how he fights. He doesn't care. It sounds so silly here, right? And a lot of times, when we look at life, we, we, give, we give up things. We compromise over things, and we think, well, it ain't no big deal. That's kind of silly, you know? And just like when we're told you can't assemble, you know? If you assemble... And, and, you, and you come together. You remember what the threat was several years ago that the state troopers would be there to take down your license plates? You're going to be fine. It happened in Lexington, if y'all don't remember. And that came from the leadership of this state here in Governor Bashir. And if you think he's a saved person, you're deceived. He's lost as a goose in a whirlwind. That's just the facts. He does not know the one true and living God of the Bible. If he did, he would not stand for what he stands for and he would not promote the things he promotes, and he sure wouldn't come against the church. He wouldn't do that, but he did. I don't care if he is a deacon in the liberal church he's a part of. It does not matter. He does not know the God of the Bible. That's plain. You say, you don't, have, you don't see his heart, but I don't have to see his heart. He lets me see it. Pretty, pretty simple. But some folks say, well, what's the big deal? What's the problem? The problem is, God said one thing, and man said another thing. And we can say, well, not a big deal. We can still go home. We can still do our little Facebook Live. We can still assemble that way, so to speak. But that's not biblical assembly. And you do what God says, not what man says, and then you deal with the consequences if man wants to come your way. But you've got to trust in him. And a lot of times what we did was compromise some biblical principles because we thought it was silly. What's the big deal? You know? I know there was plenty of folks that questioned my decision to continue to stay, have the doors open to be in-person service. Not so many here, thank God. 
There's plenty out there that thought it was silly. But at the end of the day, I didn't claim to be a rocket scientist. I didn't claim to be a doctor. I didn't claim to have all this stuff figured out. But what I did claim is to understand what the Bible said, and there was no asterisk. There was no do this except if this is going on or that's going on. You to be faithful to God. I'm going to be faithful to God no matter what's going on. God did not tell Daniel to stay faithful to me as long as you're still in Jerusalem, as long as your mommy and your daddy, as long as there ain't no troubles or trials, then if there is, you know, you just backpedal and do whatever you can to survive. That's not what God said, folks. You know what God told his disciples? Guess what's going to happen to you? They're going to deliver you up before men. Some of you are going to be put to prison. Some of you are going to be put to death. But he said, don't worry about what you're going to say. You just trust in me. And when the time comes, the Holy Spirit of God will give you what you need to say. You don't have to be all couraged up thinking that you're going to be able to do it on your own. You just need to trust the Lord. So what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did, that's what Daniel done multiple occasions. I let God empower him. But you've got to keep your eyes on no matter how silly the attack may seem to be. You know? Look what happens. The king was displeased with himself. Then he set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored to the going down of the sun to deliver him. <laughs> Aren't you glad that our hope is not in earthly rulers? When you face the lion, folks, you've got to make sure where your faith is at and who it is in. Let me tell you something. I look at this whole world, it, it disgusts me. I told you, you can tell that I'm not a big fan of our governor. I respect him as, a, as the governor of this state uh, and so on and so forth, but I'm not a fan of him. And I'm not a fan at all of him, not a fan of our current president, not a fan of a lot of our leadership, to be honest, and don't care what party they're with. Pretty disgusted with a lot of our rulers in this country. I'm disgusted with how far we have came from where God brought us initially as a country. Let me tell you something. At the end of the day, and hopefully you're going to go vote here in just a little bit uh, as, as, as the primary comes along to vote on who you think ought to be the next governor based on biblical principles. I hope that's what you do. But at the end of the day, you know what? There's not an earthly ruler one save the king of all kings, Jesus himself, that's going to be able to deliver us. Darius wanted to, didn't he? Says he was displeased with himself. He was upset with the fact he signed the decree. He thought on all day about how he could deliver Daniel, which I think is kind of silly. I think it's kind of silly because he signed the decree. Now, I know what they played. And I know that we said, well, it's the law of the Medes and the Persians that alter it not. I understand that. I understand what their culture is. I understand that's how they ruled, so there would be nobody that would question it. That's how they did it. And when something was established, it was never going to be changed. And so, therefore, when it came about, nobody in the, in the kingdom ever questioned it. There was no way things were going to get changed. They didn't do that then. But could they not change it? I don't see why they couldn't. He's the king. Would he have to say, well, I know that that's what we've always done, but this is ignorant. And we don't have to do ignorant. That's just like us. When a law was made, how long was Roe versus Wade? How long did that come about? How long did they say that this was a national thing, that, that abortion should be legal in the entire country with no state government having a choice in it? It was a long time, right? Millions of babies lost their life in this country. And you know what's happened for many years? People thought the law of the Medes and the Persians. They thought it was established. They thought because the Supreme Court of this country said that, that abortion should be okay in, throughout the country without any type of state government having a say in it, that's what went on. Millions of babies. Yeah, 70-something. Million 
babies in this country. Until not too long ago, when they ruled and overturned that, and they said it would be up to the state. Which I think, to me, honestly, should just be its illegal period. But at least the state was able to have some type of say now, and then it gets a little more personal for us to be able to talk to our senators and representatives and to get something done at a state level. At least there's a fighting chance there where before there wasn't any. But it went years. And you know what people did? They didn't fight much. You know why they didn't fight much for it? Because they just thought it was already there. You can't change it. And you know what? That's not necessarily complete fallacy in your mind because a lot of times when a law is passed, when something is established, very little times is it overturned. Very little time. But does that mean that you shouldn't fight for it? We ought to fight for it. So when I think about this situation here, I think about King Darius, and I know what the Medes and the Persians did, but I still have in my mind, have a hard time wrapping around the thought that if I'm the king and this decree has been, I'm the one to sign the decree, why can't I erase my name? Why can't I back up on it? But he didn't. He didn't. That's the facts. He did not. He tried all day to figure out a plan. That's why when you face the lions, you don't depend upon man. You depend upon God. When you're going through things in this life, folks, you cannot keep your eyes fixed on man or your circumstances to think that's going to deliver you. It's not going to happen, folks. You've got to trust in the Lord Jesus who has a purpose and a plan. I, I, I want us to understand, he's got a plan out here. It's a big plan. He's, and you involved in that plan, whether you recognize that or not. And how he keeps it all together, I don't know. Okay? But he's God, I'm not, and I'm glad of that. And I can trust in him, but he's got this plan from here to here, and somehow or another, everybody that's ever been, ever will be, is fit in that plan. I know his first desire is for all men to be saved. He desires for every single person to repent of their sin and trust in Jesus as the one true and living God who became a man, who died on the cross, who rose again, overcoming their sin. He desires all people everywhere, men, women, boys, girls, no matter what your skin color, nationality may be, he desires everybody to be saved. He shed his blood for the extent of the sin of the entire world. He desires for you to be born again, adopted into his family, and know you're going to heaven when you die or he comes again. That's what he desires first and foremost in that plan. And then after that, Ha, he has you fit in there in this eternal plan. Somehow you're plugged in there and your life isn't an accident, folks. He's got his eyes fixed on you. And yes, you have a freedom and he allows you to exercise those freedoms. But guess what? There's sometimes he puts roadblocks here. Sometimes he puts roadblocks there. Sometimes he doesn't allow certain things to happen. Sometimes he causes things to happen. Sometimes he allows it to happen to bring you to places in your life where he wants you to be. That's how he says he can work all things out for the good of those who love him and are called to his purpose because he's working on you and in you and around you. He's above you, under you, all around doing the work. And you've got to trust that. You can't depend upon man to fix everything. And that's what we want to do. We all have that tendency. I'm going to make me a phone call. I'm going to get this done. I'm going to get that done. You know what I've learned over the years? Most of the time you ain't got that much control. And you know what else I've learned? It's probably a good thing. That's when we just got to trust him and depend upon him. It says, then these men assembled to the king and said unto the king, know, O king, that the law of the Medes and the Persians is that no decree nor statute which the king establisheth may be changed. How oh, they're playing the king. They played him like a fiddle from the beginning. And this guy shall be smarter than that, but he's not. And that's okay because we're not trusting in fallible man. We're trusting in 
an omnipotent, omniscient God who's in control. It says, then the king commanded and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said to Daniel, listen how the king speaks. Daniel, thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. Now it doesn't say that Daniel was looking for a word of encouragement, <laughs> but he got one. Now, from, to me, it would seem to be one of the oddest people for him to get it from. This is the guy that signed the decree. This is the guy that allowed this group to manipulate him. This is a guy who allowed the, the, this group to keep him pushed forward on this ignorant culture of the Medes and the Persians. But he looks at Daniel, whom he knows. He knows Daniel very well. Daniel's right under him. Daniel's been the one running the kingdom. Darius is trusting him. The favor of God was upon him. He knows exactly how Daniel is. That's why he kicked himself when they said, hey, you know Daniel, the one that's of the captivity of the children of Judah, he has disregarded you, and he has prayed not one time, but three times a day. And that's why he was displeased with himself, because he's like me sometimes, we don't always remember everything. And when all that was happening, he never thought about Daniel until it was brought to his attention. And he thought, oh, how foolish I am. But he looked at Daniel and he said, Daniel, the God in whom you serve continually, he will deliver thee. He did not say he might be able to deliver you. Hopefully he would deliver you. He delivered you before, right? He delivered you before, maybe he can deliver you again. No. He said he will deliver thee. It says a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet, and with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. When you face the lions, you got to not only remember who you are, okay? In, in Christ, you don't just need to know who you're trusting, but you also just need to persevere. I mean, we don't know what the outcome's going to be in our life on certain things. We don't know that. But we do know whom we trust. And it's going to be okay, isn't it? I mean, think about it. Think about your circumstance for just a minute. Maybe one you've already been through. Maybe you're in the middle of something now. I don't know. But most of the time, what we can do, if we can, if we can just get ourselves in the right spot for a minute, mentally and spiritually, and step back for a minute and look at things and think about the Lord, guess what you're going to find out, what you're going to think, and what you're going to realize? It's going to be okay. When you get in the Word, when you get on your knees, when you talk to the Lord, when you come and worship, when you're doing what God tells you to do, you know what you're going to find out, what you're going to be reminded of, what you're going to be confident in? It's going to be okay. And so what are you supposed to do? Persevere. Keep pushing forward. Just keep pushing forward. Quit worrying about the things you cannot fix or change. Oh, the king tried all day to figure out how to deliver Daniel from the situation, but he could not come up with an idea except for just change it. But he wasn't going to do that because... All of a sudden, he's going against what the Medes and the Persians do all the time. It's, they don't change nothing. No matter how stupid or ignorant it is, they're not changing it. So we're going to just live out our ignorance. Well, he told Daniel, God's going to deliver thee. And then he tells the rest, you put the, you cover it up. You put your lid on it. You lay, as he says, they brought that stone, laid it there upon the mouth of the den of the lions. They sealed it. But Daniel persevered. Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. Neither were there instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. Poor baby. Huh? I mean, poor pitiful King Darius got deceived by the group of folks, 
where he had to put his friend Daniel in the lion's den. Oh, he wasted a whole day, couldn't figure out how to deliver his friend, and then went home at nighttime and didn't even get his lullaby. Didn't even get his midnight snack. And didn't even get a sleep. Huh? Poor baby Darius. You know? But what Daniel do? Daniel gonna snuggle up to the lions. Daniel wasn't worried about eating or being eaten. He won't worry about it. He just persevere. Uh, you know what I think? I don't know where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego at this time. It's been a long time. So maybe they've died of old age. Maybe they died of some sickness. I don't know what happened to them. But I have a hard time not thinking that Daniel, when he faces this time, probably had some words of his friends come into his mind. Because you remember when Nebuchadnezzar was there with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they said, hey, hey, maybe y'all just didn't understand what the decree was. That when y'all heard all the instruments going on, you're supposed to bow down and worship this image that I made. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, no, uh, we completely understood what we were supposed to do, Nebuchadnezzar. The problem is, whether our God desires to deliver us out of the fiery furnace or not, that's up to him. But we are not bowing down to your image. And so Nebuchadnezzar got so mad that he stoked up the fire, what, seven times hotter than what it was? Got so hot that when the men got to throw their Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fiery furnace, they died, not, not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When they started looking in there, they said, well, hold on a second. What is it, three or four? And they said, well, there's three. They said, well, we see one that looks like the Son of God there. And there was four of them. And they're walking around in the fire. And when they come out of the fire, they didn't have a hair one singed on them. And they didn't have no smoke smell on them. And they were fine and without any harm done to them. So I can just think that Daniel, at 85 years old, is thinking in his mind as he's facing the lion's den, huh? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, whatever the outcome is, it didn't matter to them. They're going to serve their God. And you know what Daniel said? No matter what the lions do, I'm going to serve my God. I'm going to persevere. I'm not going to back up. I'm not going to shut up. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to stay faithful to my God. And folks, that's what the church needs today. We need a little bit of perseverance in our lives. We need some commitment. We need to follow after our God, and we just got to let the chips fall where they may because we know that our God's in control. We need to face the lions and persevere. Well, that... Old Darius didn't get his music, didn't get his snack, didn't get no sleep that night. I don't be too hard on him. I mean, he, he did care about Daniel. That's obvious. And he did say that the God in whom you serve will deliver thee. I mean, I give the man that credit. I don't be too hard on him. I just feel like that Darius is much like us, so many of us uh, believers, that are sissies. Hey, sometimes you just got a man up. And sometimes you just got a woman up. Sometimes you got to humble yourself and say, you know what? I need to change something. And Darius could have done that. I, ha I have no doubt in my mind that he could have done something different. But he didn't. He did not. He chose to go with his culture. You know what we do a lot of times? We choose to go with our culture. Instead of taking stances, you know what preachers have done all these years? Instead of taking stances like they're supposed to, they either say nothing or they try to give some Bible verse or two to why they allow this liberal garbage to come into their church. Some excuse on why abortion should be okay or the homosexual agenda can be okay or this transgender movement can be okay. 
Why we allow other things that happen in the church? We say nothing, do nothing. Or if we do, it's contrary to the word of God. Instead of standing firm upon the scripture. My job is not here to beat everybody down. My job, though, is to preach the book. And as you preach the whole counsel of the Word of God, you know what? The Spirit of God, the Word of God, they, it does, they do their job. That's what we have to trust. Darius was weak. And so the next day, when he got up in the morning, well, he didn't have to wake up. He's already up. But he came over to the lines then with a lamentable voice. And he said, Daniel, he probably crackling his voice, crying. Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions? Man, I love Daniel's response. Daniel did not have a bitter heart. Daniel was not mad or angry with the king. I can't say I can respond like Daniel. I, I can't say that when they throw me in the lion's den, that I look at Darius and say, I ain't worried about them, but you need to man up, you big sissy. I have a hard time thinking that I couldn't say something to him, but Daniel, he's better than me. And when the king asked, hey, Daniel, I mean, I probably would have laid there quiet for a minute. I'm going to see how long I can lay here quiet. Let him sweat just a little longer. But no, that wasn't Daniel. He didn't operate in the flesh that day. He operated in the spirit. And he says to the king, O king, live forever. Why Daniel res respond that way? Because Daniel had loyalty. He knew what the word of God God said, that's why when you keep reading in the book of Daniel, he knew that the time of the return to Israel was right there. He knew that. He understood the 70-year prophecy of Jeremiah. He understood that as he was reading the scriptures. But he was also understood that God put them there because of their own sin. And so being loyal to Babylon and the Medes and the Persians wasn't Daniel selling out. It was Daniel trusting his God. He never compromised the law of God, but he was loyal. And he said to the king, O king, live forever. And he said, God has sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouth that they have not hurt me for as much as before him innocency was found in me also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. He said, God knows that I was innocent and God knows I didn't do anything to you. And he said, God has spared me from the lions. The king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den no manner of hurt was found in him because he believed in his God. Highlight that. Now, again, I'm not telling you that you're never going to have a trouble. Jesus came down here, God in the flesh to do the will of the Father, and where did he go? To the cross. The problem is this. Many of us can't see past the cross or past our circumstance. The Bible says Jesus counted it joy to go to the cross. Why? Why would he count it joy to go through all that he went through to endure the wrath of the Father? Why would he do that? You know why? Because he told his disciples, and he, and he knew. This wasn't the end. Oh, this was a necessity. The cross was a necessity to shed blood. The life gain was a necessity for our sin to be forgiven. But he also knew that after I give myself over to the hands of sinful men and am crucified, three days later, I'm going to raise myself from the dead. He knew what was beyond the cross. He knew that. He knew he was going to conquer it. He knew death 
was not going to hold him. He knew that the grave was not going to hold him. He knew the soldiers, the stone, the seal wasn't going to hold him. Just like the, the, the grave or the old den couldn't hold Daniel and the stone couldn't hold Daniel and the signet couldn't hold Daniel because he trusted in his God. And let me tell you something. Even if you give up life on this side of glory, and really you're not dying, remember Jesus said it. John chapter 11, those who believe in him, they never die. To be absent from this body, Paul said, to be present with the Lord. And what's going to happen? For the saved, uh, the soul and spirit of man leaves this body, goes to be with Jesus, and, and guess what's going to happen? One day he's coming again, and guess what? The grave ain't going to hold you. You're going to get a glorified body. He's going to bring your soul and spirit with him, and your glorified body's going to come up out the grave. And you're going to be united with that, and you're going to be with him in that glorified body forevermore. Paul said, death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is thy victory? Oh, there is no sting of death anymore, and the grave has no victory. Why? Because Jesus conquered it, and us in him have overcome. Oh, Darius was tickled to death. But let me tell you something. When you face, when you face the lions, you trust the Lord to fight the battle. Look what happened. The king commanded, and they brought those men that had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the lion's den. They didn't just cast them in the lion's den. Guess what else? Their children and their wives. Huh. That's some tough stuff, ain't it? But that's what happened. And those lions, whose mouth never were open to Daniel, didn't even let these folks hit the ground. Yeah, they's hungry. Darius fasted all night. They fasted too. And when that fast broke or break fast, right? That's what it means. Breakfast. They was ready for it. And they ate. And they was full. And then look what happens. God fought that battle. Did, did da Daniel have to do that? No. Did Daniel request that? No. Daniel, let the Lord take care of that. Let me tell you something. The Lord will take care of the lions in your life. Vengeance is his, saith the Lord. It's not yours. It's not mine. We're not even supposed to get in that realm. I've told y'all before that I went through some things in my life. And I, I, was, I, I went through, I mean, some tough stuff. And, and part of me in the flesh, I want to do some fleshly things. But God's grace God's grace helped me. The hardest thing for me to do in those situations was nothing, nothing. Simply trust in the Lord. And I'm not saying this boastfully, I'm saying this more just of really out of shame. I, I got so angry with, with some folks. I just said, you know what? I told a former deacon of mine, I said, listen, I've had enough. I've been pushing enough. I've had enough. And I say, you know what? If the Lord's done with me preaching, I think I'll just handle my business. I'll just handle it myself. That deacon really wasn't trying to give me no wisdom, to be honest with you. But he just looked at me and said, just keep preaching. <laughs> keep preaching. And that was the right thing to say. And it was the right thing to do. And then a friend of mine, a pastor friend of mine, sent me a, a link to a sermon. As I can't remember the guy's name. Don't remember. All I know he's talking about vengeance is the Lord's. And that's right. And though the hardest thing to do a lot of times is say nothing and do nothing, because that's contrary to who we are, we got to remember the wrath of man, there's no righteousness in that. There's no goodness in that. And Daniel let God fight his fight. Not only do we see that God took care of the lions, but look what happened as we conclude. 
the testimony of Daniel went throughout the kingdom. It's already there. I mean, they all knew Daniel, whom Daniel served. Well, look what happened with Darius. This is the law of the Medes and the Persians. Now, I think that Darius should have changed his mind. That's what I think should have happened. But Darius didn't, and here's going to come something good that he didn't. Because if he would have changed his mind then, maybe they would have tried to talk him in and change his mind on this one. But he didn't. Look what it says there, that in verse 25, then, then King Darius wrote unto all people, nations and language that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. He wrote, because they ruled the whole known world. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble in fear before the God of Daniel. Why? For he is the living God, steadfast forever. His kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be even unto the end. Darius became a prophet of Almighty God. Jesus is the king of all kings. Jesus will establish his kingdom forevermore, folks. See, when you stay faithful to God and face the lies and let God fight your fights, God also lives through you. It says, he delivereth and rescueth. He worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth. Who hath, the, the, who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. <laughs> when you face the lions and you let God do his work, guess what? You come out on the other side victorious. Like the old song says, whether you, whether you stay or whether you go, you're a winner either way, right? I mean, and so in this situation, Daniel came out, not like everybody, not everybody gets delivered from the lion's den, but, but, you know what happens for those that die in the Lord? The book of Revelation says, they rest. And then you know what else it says? Their works follow them. That's why great men and women of the faith in the past that have been faithful to their Lord, even though they go to be with him, their legacy continues on in Christ. And folks will say, hey, that person right there, they're God, real God, the one true and living God. What about you? Living for him? You face the lines of this life? Are you facing them like Daniel did? If not, how come? Why? If you know Christ, it's really a why. Why are you not being faithful? You know, if you don't know Christ, I can understand how you're going to face it all by yourself. But you don't have to. You can come to Jesus. And you can turn from your sin and he will save you. He'll forgive you. He will come inside of you. He'll give heaven as your home and he will work in and through your life and the here and now to help you face the lions. And you'll come out victorious. So what about you today? Miss Stephanie, will you come and lead us in a time of invitation? As she makes her way, we're going to pray. But if you got to come, listen, where did Daniel start? On his knees. He started on his knees, folks. When the decree came, he went to his knees, and he prayed to his God. He did not go and try to plea a case before Darius. He did not try to do anything else, but he went to his God because he knew how to face the lions. What about you? We've got to start on our knees before God. Let's pray. Father, we bow before you tonight. Ask you to move during the invitation. Save the lost if there's someone here lost. And Lord Jesus, for those that are saved and you're doing our work in our hearts, may we get out of our pews and our comfort zones and bow our face before you, seeking you tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the victory that we have in you. May we experience that victory as we follow after you in faith. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.